Our vision at Benedictine College is to transform culture in America. Tell me a better way you can transform col- the healthcare culture in America than by having faithful Catholic doctors trained in a faithful Catholic medical school on a faithful Catholic college campus. God bless everyone. Welcome back to the Loopcast, where we talk faith, culture, and politics. Today, I am honored to be joined by the president of Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas, President Stephen Menace. Thank you so much for joining today. Oh my gosh, what an honor for me to be here. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Loop and the Loop cast, and uh, my wife is uh, really excited, ready to call her family and friends that I'm on the Loop cast, and I said, well, let's see how it goes first, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it was very uh, fortunate getting your wife's blessing. I think she's kind of responsible for getting us here today, so I think shout so out to your wife. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she'll come up later, though. That's not the, the only time we'll hear about her. So I wanted to get back to the start, if we could, President Minnis. Um, so it's kind of, you're in kind of a unique situation because not only are you the president currently, but you also are an alumnus of the university or right. of the college. rather. Right. Uh-huh. And so I want you to take me back. I see that you attended college and you also met your wife there. I need to confirm this true. You're, you're very tied to the college. Oh yeah. So I graduated in 82 from Benedictine. Amy graduated in 84. We met, uh, I was, uh, a uh, junior, she was a freshman. We met the f- her first week of school. I chased her for about nine months before she'd ever go out with me. Okay, and so, but uh, that was that was the luckiest thing uh, that ever happened. So we dated while I was uh, there. I went to law school at Washburn in Topeka after uh, after Benedictine, and then after law school, uh, I got an MBA. But I also then became a prosecutor. I was an assistant district attorney in Kansas City. I worked for. Sprint Corporation, which is now T-Mobile. I uh, worked for them for 14 years. Uh, but the last 12 of those 14, I was on the board of directors of the college. And so when my predecessor left, I, I went to the chair and I said, hey, look, it, I don't have any experience for this job. You guys would be crazy to hire me. And they did. That was 19 years ago and they haven't got rid of me yet. So uh, we, we, lit, we moved here and we've just, it's just been a true blessing for us to be here. Yeah. And that's a question I wanted to ask because, you know, you were doing very well. I mean, having three degrees is very impressive as it is. I'm sure you had a great job. What was so compelling to make you want to come back and serve in a president capacity? Sure. I I never had a desire to be the president of a college, but I was open to being president of my alma mater, you know, Benedictine. And and so that's probably what propelled me. In the end, I asked myself, okay, uh, if I have a choice between making an impact on young people or being a regulatory lawyer for uh, major corporation, <clears throat> what would I choose? Well, I, you know, the answer is pretty simple. And so it's not very often that you, uh, uh, you're one of them, Tom, but it's not very often that you get to work in, in a place where your, your personal mission matches with the mission of the organization. And so it's really, really exciting and just an honor to, for me to be here. Yeah. And uh, you're coming up on a 20 year anniversary and that's a long time. And also uh, something that I think not a lot of people know, but Benedictine College has been around in uh, under a different name, but I believe it was initially St. Benedict's College. Uh, it's been around over two, 150 years, and right. I think the word tradition comes up quite a bit. So uh, when you were there till now, it seems like a lot of the traditions have been preserved. How important is that founding tradition of Benedictine College to you and the students currently? Well, very, very important. I think it's really important for uh, the our students to have a sense of our history. So. We were founded in 1858. So I think about that for a second. That's three years before the Civil War on the Kansas and Missouri border. You know your history is not a great place to start anything, okay, right? But the monks were tough and wanted to start a school for the Lord's service, and they did that. And so this is a school that's like literally survived the Civil War and two pandemics and the Great Depression and two world wars and the civil unrest of the 60s, the financial burden of the 70s and uh, 80s, and so. Um, but you know, so lots of ups and downs, and uh, we want to continually remind our students that it wasn't so easy starting a place here on the prairie. So we try to keep those traditions going. One of the traditions that's going to happen just in two weeks is uh, we're the only school in America that still <clears throat> requires our freshmen to wear beanies on the first week of school. And so um, I think there's a little trepidation with that. It's not a hazing thing. It's more of an <laughs> identification thing, right? You know, so now our students during the first week, our freshmen walk into the dining hall and they say, oh gosh, I'm new here. What should I do? <clears throat> well, there's a sea of beanies in there they can sit with their classmates. And uh, you'll probably have about 75% of them actually wear them 
underneath their mortar boards four years later at graduation. So kids really embrace that tradition. Yeah, that's beautiful. And just to, to be clear, I believe there is a punishment associated with losing that beanie <laughs> during the week. Is well, that true? There is. You have, <clears throat> if you're found without your beanie, for whatever reason, somebody takes it off, but you have to stand on the highest point uh, in that place and call three times, you know, call, call, call <laughs> as loud as you can. <laughs> if it's not loud enough, uh, you will get booed and you'll have to do it, do it again. So it's pretty funny. Actually, and everybody knows this tradition. So if you're, if you're at Walmart, literally if you're at Walmart, the Walmart workers will pull your beanie and you'll have to stand on the highest point in Walmart and call three times. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of a fun thing, do not, actually. Yeah. Do not be caught at Walmart without that beanie on, Don't guys. Don't lose Keep your beanie. for the week. Yeah. Um, so another thing that I wanted to ask, too, and it, I think it kind of looks backward and forward at the same time. So uh, the Benedictines, there's monks on campus. That's right. And the, the Benedictines have a very distinct spirit. I know when I think of Benedictines, I think of Aura at Labora praying work. Right. Uh, so what is it like to attend as a student with monks on campus? And do you feel that the Benedictine spirit kind of permeates life on campus? It, it really does. And we, real, we take some of the uh, ideals and the rules and the values from the, the rule of St. Benedict. So think about this. Uh, St. Benedict wrote a rule. Uh, that's uh, in 1,500 years ago, and it's the oldest organizational constitution in the world, still being read every day by the monks at dinner. Uh, the sis Benedictine sisters across town read it every day at, at lunch, and it's, it's really an incredible document. Two things that we take, three things actually, we take a lot from there. Well, number one is, ut nomnibus glorificator Deus, which is that in all things God may be glorified. So you see UIOGD a lot on our campus to remind her students that in all things God may be glorified. And then secondly, prayer and work, um, you know, to work is to pray, to pray is to work. And so that's really an important part of our, our charism. And then finally, this humility of hospitality. Um, St. Benedict writes in his rule, and I think it's really powerful, Tom, he writes in his rule that every guest, and he defines guest broadly, every person, every person should be greeted as if they're Jesus Christ themselves. Every guest should be greeted as if they're Christ. So I'll, have a, I'll give a talk to business leaders and I'll say, if you run a customer service department like that, you're, you're going to be a pretty good company, right? And so we tell our students all the time, hey, listen, you're at a Benedictine school. So you have different responsibilities than other students at other schools. One of those responsibilities is to treat others as Christ. And so <clears throat> we tell them all the time, look, it, if you're walking down the sidewalk and Jesus is walking towards you, wouldn't you take your earbuds out of your ears and stop texting and have a conversation with them? Of course you would. So uh, now our students don't always listen to me, but we we really <laughs> emphasize this notion that you're to treat your other your fellow classmate, any guest on campus, your professors, uh, people you you are here with as Christ. It's an incredible aspirational goal of everybody. I wish I could say that I do it all the time. I don't. No one's perfect. But it is something <clears throat> we strive to emphasize here, and that comes straight from the rule of St. Benedict. So that charism really permeates the entire place here. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And, and you're a really popular guy, President Menace. Oh, and I, I think when, when people think of you, there's something that comes to mind. You are somewhat of a savant for names. I don't think you've ever <laughs> forgotten a name before. Well, and it, I guess it makes a lot more sense in light of what you said about the hospitality tradition that comes with that. So was that something that you've just always been kind of unusually good at remembering names, or is that something you've developed as president of Benedictine College? I think a lot of people want to know. I don't know. You know, I, uh, when I came, there was 900 students. So it was a lot easier to remember by his name when he had 900 students. Now, now we've got 2,200 students, and, uh, and uh, we have 18 years of graduates, uh, I have to remember. So it, it's, getting, it's getting more difficult all the time. But it's really important. I, I study. I have a... a, a picture book basically with everybody's picture on it and their name and where they're from. So I really, really try to study. I mean, it's important. We're, we're people place. People, you know, like prospective students all the time visit us in the summertime. And I tell them, hey, it's really great that you're here in the summer. But when you come and visit us college in the summertime, you're going to make a decision based on buildings. Okay. And we got beautiful buildings here, but we're a people place. Okay. And so it's really important for us to, to uh, understand that. And I have to say, uh, secret, I don't know if you remember, but I actually came and visited during a siblings week. My, my older oh, brother Sarah. attended. <laughs> you, you passed on the name check. You remembered his name. Shout okay. out to my brother, Alex. Alex. But um, 
I will never forget. I sat down at a table with my family and you came and sat down with us and you said something to the same effect, but it was kind of one of those moments where I was like, who, like you're the president, you have a lot of responsibilities. You're a very busy guy. You could have been talking to anyone. You came to talk to a family at a table during a lunch, during a siblings week. And so I, that was very impactful for me. It meant a lot. Um, and so I wanted to ask them too on that, that growth. It's unsurprising. I mean, you, you've really leveled up Benedictine, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, so question then, uh, you, you've now reached a milestone of over 2,000 students. Um, and you, I, there's an emphasis in a lot of my research on becoming a nationally respected university. Um, what does that mean to you to have national recognition? And what do you want to be recognized for? Well, that's that's really a great question, and really come, you know, we've been really blessed. Okay, the last fifteen years, our enrollments doubled. We built fourteen new residence halls and six academic buildings. We've started new programs, which are pretty unusual for small liberal arts Catholic colleges. Engineering, architecture are, are two really good examples. And people ask me this all the time. Okay, what's the secret? Right? You hear all across the country, enrollments are going down and schools are closing, et cetera. Why all this success and why now? And our answer is pretty simple, uh, Tom. We looked at two things. Number one, we embraced our mother. And the second thing, we embraced our mission. Okay, we embraced our mother. We consecrated the college to the Blessed Virgin Mary. We did that 10 years ago. We had 1,000 students circle the campus. They prayed a simultaneous rosary. When the rosary was done, we gave them each a Pope-blessed, miraculous medal that they then buried in the ground. So her graces would surround the entire campus. And we kind of think that if you put the college in her hands, great things are going to happen. And that's kind of what's happened here. Second thing we did, we embraced our mission. We made a decision that uh, we were going to be a mission-driven place. Everything that we're going to do, every decision we made is going to be consistent with that mission. Our mission to educate our students within a community of faith and scholarship. And so that, uh, and, and, and that's made all the difference. Uh, you're awful nice to say, that I had anything to do with it. Uh, listen, it's all Our Lady, and it's all uh, the, the commitment of the people here to commit ourselves to the mission, and that's that's why we've been able to do this. And we also knew, to your, your point about being national, um, when I came, we looked at the demographics, and we saw that uh, the number of college-age students in the Midwest and the Northeast were going to uh, uh, drop uh, pretty quickly, okay? And so we said to ourselves, we can't afford to be a regional college, okay, because the, uh, our, our constituents uh, in the region were, were, were decreasing. So we, we made a commitment to try to create a national reputation, the bulk of which comes from, uh, you know, the, uh, our Catholic identity. But most state schools and small liberal arts colleges will usually have about 75% of their students from their home state, okay? We only have 20% of our students come from Kansas. So we're very uh, wide uh, range of, uh, you know, we have kids from all over the country, all 50 states, and it's really inspiring. It's, it's incredible diversity of geography on our campus, uh, so. Yeah, it, it seems like uh, in some ways an underdog story as well, because you mentioned it's Atchison, Kansas, you know, it's in the middle of the Midwest. And th there's a lot of schools, I think, that try to attract students because, oh, we're in California and, oh, come check out the swimming pool we just built. But I think you really touched on something important, the Catholic identity. And so Benedictine College is, is proud to be on the Newman Guide list for schools. And I think uh, not everyone maybe understands exactly what that means. I think a lot of people have kind of heard of it now. There's a lot of Catholic schools out there that aren't on this list. And uh, the, the Newman Guide, I want to hear from your perspective. What does it mean to you that Benedictine College is on the Newman Guide, and what separates it from, say, a Catholic school that's not on the Newman Guide? Well, I, it, you know, we basically adhere to the tenets of the faith, and uh, it, we're very proud to be in the Newman Guide. That's helped us uh, get a national reputation. Uh, if we get a kid from, you know, the Washington State, or I think your family's from Michigan, I think, right? Is that right, Tom? So. I mean, you get well it. done. Yeah, you get it. You get a, a family like that, and they say, okay, how did you hear about Benedictine? Well, you're the Newman guide, and my folks said I can go to a Newman guide school, so we're going to check them out. So, I, so it's yeah. been very, very helpful to us. But, you know, I, I'll just tell you a kind of interesting story because I think your listeners will be interested in that. So in the late 1960s, early 70s, okay, our, our enrollment was at, at its peak until just recently. And um, there was these Catholic administrators that got together in Land O'Lakes, uh, Wisconsin, 
and cre created the Land of Lakes document, which basically was kind of the blueprint for Catholic higher education. They didn't think they were getting respect in the academy uh, because they were Catholic. So they decided, we're going to put our faith on the shelf here, and we're going to go all in on academic excellence. And so that became the blueprint for Catholic uh, universities, which we followed from that moment that that was instituted, and we've started following our enrollment just drop precipitously. Until 1991, we had 570 students, okay, 570. Um, that happened to be the year that John Paul II came out with Excordia Ecclesiae, which now became a new blueprint for Catholic education. And John Paul II basically said, look it, not only can you be faithfully Catholic and academically excellent, being faithfully Catholic demands that you're academically excellent. So now you had a new blueprint for Catholic higher education. And so Catholic schools had a, had a, um, a decision to make. You want to follow the uh, blueprint set out by these college administrators, or you want to do, follow a blueprint set out by the Pope. We chose the Pope. Not, er not everybody did, however, I will tell you, not everybody did. And so from that moment on, 570 students in 91 to over 2,200 today. And that's because we followed what the Pope and what the church wants us to do. So, yeah. And I, I think, uh, so, so you met your wife in college. I also met my wife in college, full disclosure. And I went to Ave Maria University. Benedict was my second choice. But uh, I think that it, uh, to what you're saying, to put kids uh, in formational years, I think one of the things that a lot of parents are the most worried about today, Catholic parents, are their kids going to college and losing their faith. And uh, it, it's, a, it's an environment in which you could meet some of your best friends, some of your biggest influences, and potentially your spouse. And so I think um, what you said in terms of keeping the identity first, but also uh, an element of Benedictine that I think is somewhat overlooked at times is the residential aspect, you said, of uh, the mission. And so how do you, through campus events and trying to just build a vibrant culture, kind of create a place where you know you could send your your son or daughter, and they could potentially meet, as we've kind of discussed a little bit before, their spouse in the future. That's right. So, three uh, sociological studies will tell you that three things happen to young people between the ages of eighteen to twenty three. Okay, which is generally your college years. These three things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to develop lifelong relationships. People you go to college with, you have a chance to be uh, finding your, your best friends, your spouse. Uh, a mentor of some sort, a professor who will, you know, um, uh, impact you the rest of your life. That's what's going to, number one, that's going to happen. Number two is you're going to make the faith your own, right? You're going to uh, go through a time in your life, you're going to ask really important questions about what's my relationship with Jesus Christ? What's my relationship with the church? Why do bad things happen to good people? All these things happen. And if you're not at a place that is helping you in that journey, well, you'll just leave. 80% of the young people that go to college have an active faith life, 80%. By the time they graduate, that number's reduced to 18%, okay? So you have all these people leaving the college, because, and this is especially guys, I asked this, yeah, I was looking, if you're not getting fed, what, what's easier to do on Sunday morning? Getting up and going to church or getting up and playing video games, right? Okay, so so it's it's our intention we, we have all these apostolates on our campus, as, other, as do all, all these other Newman Guide schools, because we know young people come to our place. They have really important questions. They're on a very important faith journey. We want them to keep their faith in college, and that is so important. For your parents out there, I ask all the time, do you want your grandkids to be Catholic? Well, if you do, then you need to send your, you need to send your kids to a Newman Guide school at Benedictine College, right? That's awesome. Yeah. Third thing that happens is you're going to discover your vocation. Okay. So what does God have in store for you? I don't necessarily mean religious uh, or, or single, but, or married. What I do mean is like, okay, does he want you to be a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, or a teacher, or so forth? So these three things happen in college. It's so important. I tell kids all the time, college is not a four-year decision. It's a 40 or 50-year decision because things that happen in college will impact you the rest of your life. So it's a really important decision. Yeah, it is. And and I think one of the things also that makes Benedict a little bit unique, and I want your perspective on this, is you were able to develop, at most liberal arts schools, especially small ones, kind of struggle with some of the specialized programs, for example, engineering, classical architecture. So that wasn't always a thing at Benedictine College, but you've kind of almost set the tone for other small liberal arts Catholic colleges of having these specialized programs. I know you have a good nursing program as well. Uh, when did that be? 
become a priority to you? And how are you able to execute and actually create these programs for people to come and get a great education? Well, we thought it was important to have these real, uh, programs that young people really desire uh, at a place where they can not only learn to be great engineers, but also <clears throat> be in a faith-based environment and a liberal arts environment as well. Uh, when we started the engineering department, our engineers came to us and they said, look, we don't want to start it if you're not going to require all these other general educational requirements for our students, for our engineers to be engineered. Most places you go to become an engineer, that's all you do, right? Here, you still have to take your three theology classes. You have to take three philosophy classes. You have to take histories. You have to take uh, language and culture. I mean, uh, understand culture. It's really, really important. Same with nursing. Uh, a lot of times you go into a nursing program and that's all you do. Here, I mean, it's a very balanced, faith-based approach. I mean, it's really, really important. Tell you a quick story, and this is the this is the difference, right? Because there's a lot of engineering schools that our, our students pass. They're a lot less expensive than ours, but they come to us. And I'll give you a story about the reason why. One of probably our best engineering students we've ever had, uh, James, uh, goes into our, the uh, head of, of our engineering department, Darren Mugley, and says, Dr. Mugley, can you tell me how, I, how can I be a better engineer? And Dr. Mugley sits back and he says, well, I'll tell you what, the best way to become a better engineer is for you to go to adoration at least an hour a week, okay? You do that for a couple months, you come back and talk to me, and we'll talk about engineering. So uh, <laughs> you don't get that at very many other engineering places, I'll tell no. you. <laughs> no. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great story. Yeah. And and I know, so there's exciting developments too on potentially starting a medical school. I saw uh -huh. the, the Padre Pio school. And uh, so that's in the future. I want to hear more about that. But one thing that really struck me, and I think it kind of uh, really ties all of these specialized things together, is uh, putting the culture of death on notice. And I think specifically with nursing and, and healthcare, it's odd to me that there's somewhat of a separation in secularizing that care. And I think it really harms, you know, looking at people holistically and involving everything. So, so I want to hear, so where did that phrase, putting the death, culture of death on notice come from? And how do you uh, execute that when it comes to educating your nurses and future healthcare um, employees? Well, we, uh, we started nursing about 10, 11 years ago, and this has become a really important part of our thing. We named our nursing uh, building after Mother Teresa. And uh, the reason we were able to name the nursing building after Mother Teresa is, is her order gave us permission to do that as long as we had a pro-life nursing program. And if, uh, if we were ever swayed from that, then they would not allow us to use her name on our building anymore. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. I was interviewing a uh, uh, one of our prof nursing professors. I interview every uh, potential teacher on our campus. And so I start out every interviewer telling her about the building being named after Mother Teresa. We're a pro-life pro nursing program and that we don't even have to follow, finish this interview if you can't commit to you being a pro-life nurse and a teacher in our pro-life nursing program. And she said, uh, well, I have 11 children and I'm married to a deacon in the church. And I said, well, okay, that's pretty good. Um, you know, that's a good check mark. And I guess, <laughs> I guess you're pretty pro-life then. <laughs> so anyway, so, but, so that's really important. And, and so when Catholic Healthcare International came to us and then said, we want to start a faithful Catholic medical school and we want to start it on a faithful Catholic college campus are you interested? We said, absolutely. Because our vision at Benedictine College is to transform culture in America. We believe the culture is broken, okay? It brings about loneliness and hopelessness, faithlessness and truthlessness. And so we believe it's important for us to form our young people to go out and, and form them in community, faith, and scholarship so they can go out and they can transform the culture. Well, Tell me a better way you can transform cult, the healthcare culture in America than by having faithful Catholic doctors trained in a faithful Catholic medical school on a faithful Catholic college campus. It's, I mean, it is a complete game changer uh, if, if the, uh, with this proposed medical school. And, and it really will put the culture of death on notice that we're tired of this. We're tired of healthcare professionals, of all people, uh, Embracing the culture of death, it, it, it's, it's abhorrent, and it's an embarrassment for this country, and we want to change that. Wow. 
a powerful statement right there. Um, I think another element too of a lot of colleges that some people may see as somewhat disconnected from uh, what's going on usually is is sports. And I, I know that you're a sports fan yourself. Right. And Benedictine College is, is proud to host many uh, excellent sports programs, very successful in terms of our results, you know, wins and losses. Um, so is there something, I know that you've built these strong programs, they're, they're good on campus, they're good at what they do, but um, what's different about Benedictine College's athletics than, say, the athletics at a secular school? Well, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, I just addressed all the coaches last week, and I said, uh, our our mission in the athletic department is to win within the mission, win within the mission of community, faith, and scholarship. And I said, look, it, if you guys go out and win a national championship, but you do with a bunch of knuckleheads that aren't going to class and aren't involving themselves in Bible studies and, 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 uh, and creating all kinds of havoc on campus, well, we won't even put up the banner, okay, because you're not winning within the mission. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you have a bunch of choir boys and you can't win a game, well, then you're not committed <laughs> to excellence either. So, so it's this right. incredible balance of winning within the mission. I think it's a little bit different than other places, but it's really important. And, and when we just tell the coaches up front, like I said, I interview all the coaches before we even hire them. I say, okay, this is really important. And if you're not buying into this, then this is not going to be a good place for you because you're not going to be happy. Yeah, that's good. I mean, and the results don't lie. I believe you. You you have a championship ring, right? I think yeah, the uh, was it women's lacrosse. It is. Uh, so right. you got a. <laughs> I got that got big another big ring. ring. Yeah, we're a top ten football school this year, and we were last year. So we're looking forward to a, another good season there as well. Yeah, some big guys walking around campus. I remember that. I was like, this is a guy I would not want to get hit yeah, by no. for sure. So that's always a good sign <laughs> right. for the football team, right? Uh, so, uh, so I know there's, there's Beanie Week and, and right. we talked about Benedictine tradition a little bit before. Are there any kind of um, lesser known underrated traditions on campus that you appreciate? Oh, sure. So um, I'll just kind of list them. We have this thing called the, uh, the bed race. Uh, each dorm uh, makes a bed. It all has to be a, all you have to have is at least a frame and you put tires on it. And then they race through the streets of Atchison on homecoming morning. That's kind of a fun, fun uh, tradition of ours. The uh, kids are very excited about that. Uh, homecoming's uh, really a fun thing for us. You know, there's other, there's religious traditions as well. I host a Wednesday morning, 7.30 a.m. rosary uh, in the basement, uh, the Arle Guadalupe Chapel in the Abbey. And that's attended by a lot of our students, 7.30 a.m. is kind of tough for kids, right? You know, but they're there and I'm excited about that. I'll lead off the school year actually with a, uh, with a rosary in the quad outside and almost every freshman and uh, most of our students will attend that. It's a great way to kick off first day of school. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we will have uh, uh, host the largest birthday party for Our Lady on September the 8th. And I told you we're going to reconsecrate the college on that day and we will announce, um, uh, you know, we're, we're a premier sponsor for the Eucharistic Revival, and we're excited about that. And we'll announce some of the things that we're doing with re regards to the Eucharistic Revival, including an all-campus adoration hour on Thursdays at 4 o'clock. And so um, we're, we'll invite, announce that, and we'll invite all of our students and our faculty and staff to join us in the, uh, in the church every Thursday at 4 o'clock for a, a adoration hour. So those are kind of Old traditions, new traditions. Uh, one of the things that we do on the first day of school is we have an all-school mass, well, actually it's uh, during our convocation, and we, uh, we book in this tradition. We call it the March of Light. Uh, the, our students, there's a big B in the front of our, on our campus. Our, our freshmen in their beanies go around the B, they get a blessing, and then they walk off the mass. We give them a candle. They go into the grotto, place that candle, and ask Our Lady for... Uh, for blessings for the next four years. Uh, four years later at graduation, right before the baccalaureate, they line up around the bee in their cap and gown. We give them a candle. They march to the grotto, thank Our Lady for a great four years and go off to the baccalaureate mass. So those are some of the things that we do on our campus. It's, I, we think traditions and history uh, are very, very important um, at the college. It, it brings the group uh, rooms together. If our mission is to educate within a community of faith and scholarship, then building that community and finding ways to do that for our, our students to get closer is really important. 
Yeah, and uh, something you said just really piqued my interest too, because you said you know the the tie to history keeps us together, and it seems like secularly at least there's a lot of attempts to sever us from from our history, whether that's intellectual tradition yeah. or tearing down statues or trying to you know smear you know founding fathers or, or whatever it is. It seems right. like there's kind of a, a general embrace to just completely sever from history. We need to move on. We need to be progressive, whatever that means. Um, so. Uh, why do you think that trend is so common right now, specifically in academia? And um, how, I've seen you've done so many ways to defend it, but, but why is it so widespread right now, I guess? It seems like what you're doing at Benedict, it makes a lot of sense to me, but why is it happening everywhere else? I, I, I don't get it. I mean, you know, um, sometimes I, I worry that there is a grand plan out there. I think Marx said, hey, <laughs> give, give me five universities and I'll change the world, right? You know, and, and that... Uh, this has seeped into the universities around the country. One of the things that, that we're doing is we're building a new library in our campus, but it's not gonna be like any other library that you, you've ever seen. This library is, uh, it'll be a traditional library, but there is gonna be a part in there that's gonna look like uh, Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And in that building is gonna be a replica of the assembly room in, uh, in Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And this will be a uh, place where we can bring our students as well as young people into uh, the assembly room, which is where they debated the declaration, where they wrote the constitution. And <clears throat> it becomes a place now in the region where we can bring young people and teach them about the specialness and exceptionality of this great country of ours. We, I mean, you kind of mentioned this without mentioning it. We, we kind of believe uh, schools around the country are teaching anti-American history, okay? But we love our country, okay? And we believe the last best hope on earth needs to be celebrated. And those values and those traditions and that history needs to be passed on from one generation to the next. If you don't pass it on, as Ronald Reagan says, uh, if you don't pass the, the, the values of freedom to the next generation, uh, then you'll lose it. And so uh, we feel it's our duty. We're going to transform culture in America that we have to emphasize the the greatness of america as well yeah and i'm so glad you brought that up because so I, I studied politics in college and now work for catholic vote a lot of our work with the loop has has to do with a lot of these things that you're talking about and we're somewhat connected i know that tom hoops is over at benedict right. as well and we we love to stay in touch with him and um one of the things and you, you mentioned debate you mentioned history uh i feel like there's kind of a general consensus we're not able to debate properly anymore or to uh, uh have logical uh, conversations with each other. Everything seems very polarized and emotional. And um, I think specifically when it comes to politics, that happens quite a bit. And so I know that Tom's doing a great job over there uh, with the department. But when you mentioned changing culture, creating students that are going to be able to go out and say, you know, work for Catholic Vote or work for places that are going to be able to make an impact. Um, how, how do you, so when you send a graduate out the door, what things are you doing at Benedictine College specifically so that they're able to like you said, you're going out into kind of a, a Marxist, uh, a paradise in some ways. Now, it seems like a lot of places feel like that, either in, in the workplace or if they're actually, you know, an attorney or something like that. What are you equipping them with to be able to engage uh, and, and make real change in culture right now? I don't know if we're going to get over the fact that uh, social media almost demands outrageous activity in order to get uh, clicks, right? Okay. And so that that's going to be an issue that we're going to have to solve as a country to figure out how they you're already starting to see outrageous behavior uh, ignored or even uh, uh, voted against. You uh, you saw saw this and with the Dodgers, and you're seeing this with you know Bud Light and Target and things like that. Okay, what we want to do is we believe civil discourse is a beginning to get a be a lost art. Okay, as it, as an example, one of the things that we did is we started a Center for Constitutional Liberty as part of the center. But we have certain constitutional fellows, and they belong to moot court teams, okay? Now, they're not debate teams because uh, the debate world has turned into exactly what you described. The whoever can yell the loudest and fastest wins debates now in what I'll call technical debate tournaments. Moot court is more of civil discourse where you take a position and you, in a logical manner, try to argue your position. I, those skills, uh, I think, are so important uh, going out. Um, and 
one of the other things we tell people all the time, look at all the, all the ills that you see in this world are caused by two things. One is a lack of understanding of Jesus' message, gospel message of love, okay? If we embrace his message of love, uh, a lot of things, uh, we, we could work out a lot of things, okay? And then secondly, embracing St. Benedict's rule to treat others as Christ, Wow. Okay. If if you go into every argument or discussion with uh, out of love and treating them as Christ, um, you're going to go. You're, uh, you're going to be pretty successful, and you're going to do it the right way. Uh, true civil discourse, we think. Yeah, near to dear, near and dear to your heart as an attorney. I'm sure it's just so r- refreshing to hear that powerful antidote from from someone from a place of competence, but also. Uh, with that grounding in Benedictine thought of of treating people like Jesus, empathy, understanding. Um, President Minnis, I've I, this has been an unbelievable interview. Thank you so much for taking the okay. time. Shout out to your wife. Yeah. She was the one that, <laughs> that I hear she listens to the podcast. I oh, would yeah. like to shake her hand. <laughs> um, thank you so much yeah. for getting us in touch. We had a few people. How about getting us in touch? Um, so uh, you have an upcoming semester here uh, for any prospective students or students that are going to be enrolling in the fall. Do you have a message that you'd like to give them as this one will get published before the school school year starts? Yeah. Our message is uh, do what we do, which is uh, how we came to success. We ask our students to live the mission of community, faith, and scholarship, not for us. We ask them to live the mission so they'll live the mission after they leave, that they'll understand the power of community, that they will have a close and personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and that they'll be lifelong learners. If they can live a life like that, It'll be full, complete, and happy. So that's why we're going to ask them to fully embrace uh, what goes on here. And uh, that's, that's what we tell our young people. And my tidbit would be keep your Raven cap on, that's especially right. in Walmart. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining President Menace. This has been an honor, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get you on soon. Oh, good. Thanks so much, Sam. Appreciate you.